are we talking a ruinous amount of money here? Yeah, you're probably looking around, around the mark. Quite bad news. Yeah. Last week on YouTube, I did the most stupid thing I've ever done in my life. And that's because I bought this, which is a 2007 4.2 litre V8 Maserati Quattroporte. But it doesn't stop there because I bought this car off a bloke on Instagram, sight unseen, and it is a category S with zero service history. But if you saw the video last week, you'll have seen that the car was quite happily driving around and it actually looks pretty nice too. Yes, it needs a good clean and I need to sort out some proper number plates for the car. But other than that, all seems rather well. However, I have some suspicions about this car and I don't think all is as it seems. And today we're heading down to Exotic and Supercar to go and get this thing checked out. But before we head down there, I thought I'd jump inside and show you a few of the things that are broken on this Maserati Quattroporte. Inside the Quattroporte then, or as other road users I think are calling it the Quattroporte, I have to be honest with you, it presents very, very well. I was quite surprised when this turned up at the overall condition of the interior. And when I say that, I mainly mean the leather. Even the driver's seat, but all the rest of the seats are, well, very barely worn. And they look gorgeous, especially in this tan trim. However, you won't be surprised to hear that all of the switch gear in here has suffered quite badly from the sticky button syndrome. This is a thing that plagues Maseratis and Ferraris of this era, and this car is no different. I'm pleased to report that the infotainment seems to be working relatively well. The analog clock is gorgeous, although I can never quite set that to the correct time. All the carbon fiber trim, the leather on the dash, all seems to be, well, holding up very, very nicely. When you turn the ignition on though, a few cracks begin to appear. Firstly, scheduled service overdue comes up and we have a brake light failure and parking sensor failure warning. Now I've inspected the brake lights and they seem to be working without any issue at all. And also the parking sensors, as long as I press this P on button here, do seem to work. So perhaps that's just some Italianness coming through and the poor girl is getting a little bit confused. There's quite a few bumps and scuffs around the exterior of the car, although the wheels look fantastic as they've recently been refurbished. It's definitely due a set of tires this car. There's various bits of trim missing here and there. The electric mirrors are broken as well. This switch here for moving both left and right, well, I can't seem to select right. So I can only adjust the mirror slightly on the left with this broken control. But you know what? On the face of it, for a very, very cheap Category S, sight unseen, Italian essentially supercar that's almost 20 years old, it doesn't seem too bad, right? However, my main concern with this car and the thing that I didn't tell you about last week is what happens when you turn over the engine. So my Quattroporte makes a rather nasty rattle when starting the engine. And it doesn't take too much Googling to find out that these 4.2 litre V8 engines are plagued with an issue known as the cam variator issue. Now, I'm not gonna give you a technical analysis of what this problem is, but from what I can comprehend, it's something to do with getting oil to various components of the engine when it's cold. And this is an issue that tends to be worse when the car is cold, but I've also noticed the rattle happening, just like now, when the car is already hot. And that can be quite indicative of a cam variator issue. Now, from further Googling that I kind of wish I'd never done, it turns out that this is not a particularly cheap thing to fix. And so I'm just a little bit concerned. I now have a one hour drive in the Quattroporte to get down to Ash at Exotic and Supercar. And I'll be honest with you, I am expecting him to confirm my suspicions. And of course, we're gonna go around the rest of the car and probably find out a few more things that I've not even been able to see that is wrong with it. So this is going to be quite the adventure and I hope you guys want to come along with me. And very quickly, if you are enjoying these episodes and you're as anxious to find out what's gonna happen with this Crash Porte as I am, you can see my videos now 24 hours before everyone else by joining my early access supporters here on Patreon. I'll leave the link in the description. I've got about an hour's long drive now to get to exotic and supercar towards the south coast of England. And to be honest, this is gonna be the longest drive I've done in my Quattroporte by far. In fact, I've done a total of about 15 miles in this thing to date. 
and I'm going to be doing, well, almost 100 today, so wish me luck. <laughs> Okay, so I made it here and, uh, well, it was about an hour's drive and the car felt pretty good to me. And I actually managed to average about 21 MPG, I think it was over like a 50 mile run, which was quite surprising. And I wasn't just driving like Miss Daisy either, but this is what we've been waiting for. This is Ash here and he's going to have a look. Well, we're already under the car and we're gonna find out why this thing was so cheap because there's got to be a reason. <laughs> so straight to it, very common, oh, uh, yeah. broken exhaust clamp, you can see it's got a bit of soot there, so it's obviously blowing. Yeah. Corrosion on the subframe, that's pretty normal to be fair. Yeah. Uh, good wax all. Quite crispy. Quite crispy, not too bad. It's not gone through. Okay. So we're always looking for obviously corrosion, brake pipes, you always want to check the brake pipes. That's normal. Always fold them back. <laughs> so like little heat protection. So you got your diff here. It looks nice and dry to be fair. Doesn't look like it's been touched for a long time. Good service history on this car. Absolutely not. I've got <laughs> right, a okay. single piece of paper, which no. is the MOT certificate that was done last week, which was a... That's nice, impressive. <laughs> a, a questionable <laughs> MOT certificate, I think. Someone's it? got a good friend. <laughs> but yeah, that is literally it. Other than that, I know nothing about this car. Um, so you bought it blind or...? Bought it pretty blind. Um, Instagram car dealer. Okay. Um, so category S car. Have, like you be, have you been blocked on Instagram yet? Or? I've not been blocked on Instagram yet, no. <laughs> Fair enough. It was a, a very dumb purchase, even by my standards. It was <laughs> extremely stupid. The interior looked nice though, it looked nice inside. Yeah, I think it to be honest... The mileage, I... like, to be fair, it looks in good condition on top. Well, you said off camera just a second ago that you, looking at it, would have said it was a 60 or 65,000 mile car. Yeah, no, car, definitely. So like, I'll take that. The panels look straight, um, wheels look nice. The back looks pretty good, to be fair. Yeah. Obviously, the rear tires are getting low, a little, yeah. bit, little bit on the inner edge. Yeah. Obviously we check the suspension bushes. Nine times out of 10, the floors are pretty good. You get your normal little bit of corrosion, but you nip that in the bud with an underseal. I'd recommend undersealing any Maserati, to be fair. Yeah. If, you, if you're gonna use them. Yeah. So this one's not past the point of being able to just underseal it then? No, a little bit of work around the back here. Yeah. Good bit of cleaning off. Have a double check on everything. Obviously the exhaust clamps, I would do them straight away. Your rubber mountain's good. These, these always rust. These are what I call superficial. They're about 10 to 12 pound each. Um, okay. I, I call them like a service item that's not on the book. They are, they're not very good, but they're there just to protect the pipes. About 10 pound. Oh, that's interesting. They, they normally got holes in them to be fair. They're not, not actually bad, bad. That's gotta be one of the cheapest Maserati parts out there, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for now, yeah. until you can't get them. Is that the issue then, lots of the time with, with parts for cars like this, is that actually it's the supply of them? S sometimes. Yeah. Um, what's a good example? Um, during COVID, couldn't get wheel bearings. You could, you could just not get them for love nor money. Um, but they've sorted themselves out. So the thing is, there's loads of breakers. I think if you use your, use it and uh, have a good look around, you'll always find what you're looking for. Yeah. But it's getting harder and harder to yes. get. Obviously your under trays damage there is taking a little bit of a whack. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a, I noticed this actually from going underneath the car, it's an <laughs> absolute mess here. And obviously you've got a bolt, bolt missing there, and I don't know if you can hear that on camera, but... Oh yeah, I can hear the knocking, yeah. A little bit in the lower shock bush. The problem with the lower shock bush is that you've got to take the top arm bolts out, okay. and you've got, then you've got the chance of, if they're seized, then you're sort of looking at bushes and bolts as well. Yeah. There's little things people can do. See, see the brake disc holes? Yes. All blocked up. Um, people can, obviously, if people are confident to jack the car up, take the wheels off, always advise making sure they're clean. Obviously, always part of the service to redrill them. Yeah. Just helps life cooling down. Do they get dirty then? Is that what it is? That's brake dust. So it literally just clogs up the just holes and stops up. the yeah. ventilation? Yeah. Oh, so, wow. I've never seen that before. So, obviously, it's quite key ventilation for these cars. They obviously they get hot. So on the outside, obviously where people jet wash the cars, yeah. you see they're a little bit better on the outside, but- Interesting, yeah. I think a couple mil drill bit through there, you can buzz them straight through. Interesting. Um, 
It's a, no, it's a nice little bit of maintenance. I would never have known I, that was a thing, honestly. So that's actually very interesting. But yeah, the brakes, I, I don't think they've been out. They look dry, they look a bit rusty. If it was me, I would be getting the pads out, cleaning them up, greasing them, giving the discs a good clean. They're not lipped, so that help you. Um, I've just seen on this tire, I don't even see that. See here, look. Yeah. So that is very sort of dangerous there. See that split? Yeah. So if that's just past an MOT, that's quite... Yeah. I don't know if you can see that in the camera. That's not good, is it? No. That's literally, yeah. No. Wow. That's your drive home. A little bit spoiled, I guess. So far though, for rust, your car's looking pretty good. So you've got, okay. you've got a few weak points, which is up here. So water sort of sits in here, sits in there. So normally it's not even being repaired. Someone's had a little lever then, caused a little crack, but on the whole, this is the main point to check here. Yeah. And then over the back here, you've got the cheeks of the engine mounts here I and see, along yeah. the back. That's the two two prime places that it's gonna go in. But to be fair, they look, the subframe looks in good condition to be fair. That's little, good news. Little bit of surface, little bit of perishing on your engine mounts, but once again, you wouldn't do anything with that. That is sort of like acceptable. We've got, got all the fluid in them. I think, yeah, rust, I think. I'll be honest with you, when you said 110,000 miles to start off with, no history, I'll be honest, with you, I was expecting a bit like a, the Mary Rose, <laughs> but, but on on the whole, because okay, so pretty decent. Rust, rust, I suppose, is one of the big ones with with these yeah. old Quattroportes. Yeah, it, in in the same places, you could almost. Yeah. It's and so on that front, you're saying that this is not it's not in need of immediate attention, but no. more preventative maintenance at this point. Would, yeah, would it's be. all it's all surface at the moment. Okay, so that could be much worse then. Yeah, I'm I not think going to, um, to drop thousands on getting that sorted straight away. Yeah, to be fair, I'd rather have a tire to change. Absolutely. Then they uh, <laughs> yeah, then sort out a front subframe. That's for sure. Okay, well that's, um, that's I suppose that's good news to an extent. Yeah, so far I'm happy with that. The back to your cam covers look. So what happens with these is you've got the top of the cam cover right on this corner here, and when they start leaking, they drip straight onto the cats. Okay. So another thing to check is if you're starting the car up from cold when you just come and look at it, make sure you can't, because you can smell burning oil inside the car. Yeah. That's normally because they've leaked from the cam cover gasket straight up onto the top of the cat and you get like an uh, oil burning smell yep. first thing in the morning. That's all well and good in terms of the underside then. Yep. I think I've said to my viewers a little bit and I think we've had a quick look at it, but yep. my main issue is now with the engine, my main sort of area <laughs> of concern. Yep, the start um, rattle, yeah. Yes, Yep. exactly. So you've got your screen wash here, power steering fluid. That's where you feel your oil. You've got a dipstick, which sometimes stick in, but that one's nice and free. Yeah, it's a really bendy dipstick, actually. I've never had <laughs> yeah. that before. It's got quite a, yeah. Nice bit of flex to it. Yeah, oil looks nice and clean. Yeah. If you ever get wiring issues on these, normally down in this corner, where the main thing goes through the bulkhead, that's where you seem to get a lot of the odd mouse and oh, I see. rodent down. If you've got horrible, weird electrical problems, loads of different stuff going on, it's either a wheel bearing or a rat down in that corner. Ah, uh, wow. So you've got the solenoids up the top here and underneath here is a variator that sits up top. And what it is, the oil back feeds out of the cam variator, out of the cam cap and back down to the bottom of the engine. Because when you do the modification on the cam cap, you put a one-way oil valve in there, which stops that from happening. So all you're hearing is the oil pressure build up in your variator is what you're hearing. Mm. But when it's warm, you can, that can also mean there's a little oil chain tensioner down the bottom. That could be broken as well. We've seen that a few times. You can just do the cam cap mod, but when it's hot and cold, it's a waste of time. Yeah. If you've caught it really early, you sometimes get away with just doing the cam caps. Yeah. But to me, Listening to this, you'd want to take airbox comes out, cam covers come off, front cover comes off. Sometimes you can have problems getting the front crank pulley off. And then behind it, you would probably do the two variators, comes with the bolts, new gaskets, and the change in the tension. It's just while you're in there, for the amount of labor that it costs, that's what you would do. But until you open it up, you don't know. So in terms of 
what I could be looking at if I decided to sort this ballpark sort of uh, are we talking a ruinous amount of money here yeah you're probably looking around it could be anywhere between four around the four mark give yeah. or give or take give what or you take. find when, you, when, when you're taking engines out or stripping stuff like if that front crank pulley don't come off or you find other stuff mm. you you got to be sort of it's like with Ferrari 355 you take the engine out you normally find coolant pipe or yeah. throttle cable in this sort of like you end up yeah. doing a little bit more depending on what you find. So you'd end up probably doing a coolant tank and you'd end up yeah, doing exactly a little bit. So you'd, a little bit. Replace the air, you'd replace both the auxiliary belts as well. So it's, it's how far do you want to go? Yeah, and, and, and I mean, it might sound like a stupid question, but in terms of like what actually happens, because I know like BMWs with their V10s, V8s, they yep. have like a rod bearing issue. And if you don't address that, it will eventually yep grenade itself essentially because yep. the shavings get the, with, with this is it like a fatal issue if it's not addressed or is it, it normally just gets worse and worse and worse yeah i've not heard of one fail yet but there's probably examples i've not personally seen one that's failed oh, that's it normally just gets louder and louder and louder and so but eventually if, if you yeah. left it it might end up i think it probably would yeah that's so interesting nine times out of ten if you've just caught it in the early stages during the summer you won't even hear it yeah but when the winter time comes and it's a bit colder, the oil's a bit thicker, it takes a little bit longer, mm. that's when it's a bit, you hear it more. It's, so. And the fact that it's been 30 degrees this week. And you can still hear it it's and it's hot. Quite bad news. Yeah. I suppose that's it then. So, I mean, the car's pretty good on the underside. Yeah. It yep. needs, you know, it needs Couple normal bits, wear and tear bits, tires, tires suspension, refresh, clean the brakes, potentially, yep, exhaust just, clamps. Just your normal, what but you expect. That is a bit of a problem for me. I'm not sure quite what I'm going to do about that. Yeah. But this one's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah, from warm. How, how far did it take you to get there? An hour. Hour, and you come here. And it's so still... it's fully at temperature. Yeah. Ouch. Oh dear, well. It was all going so well from initial inspection on the car. Everything looked pretty good. Ash and I actually went and took it for a quick drive off camera and he said that it was driving fairly well. He noticed a few knocks here and there, but nothing untoward that a 110,000 mile, 17 year old performance car wouldn't be suffering from. And then again, the underside of the car, a big concern for me was rust because these things do suffer from corrosion. And despite the fact that this is suffering from some corrosion, it's certainly not past the point of being able to be treated. And it's not something that would need to spell disaster for this car. Other than that, it was definitely apparent that the tires need replacing. And actually the one on the front left is dangerous and so, I'm going to be driving very gingerly home now, but unfortunately it stopped going so well when my suspicions were confirmed about the engine problem. It sounds like we have some bad cam variators and from what I spoke to Ash about, it sounds like it would cost almost as much as I paid for this car to fix. However, the cam variator issue in and of itself doesn't necessarily cause any issues with the car other than the rattling noise that it makes, which is very unpleasant. So despite all the positives that we can take away from today, that is a pretty shocking bill, or at least quote, that I have been left with from this Maserati. And this is perhaps the first time that I have truly been stung <laughs> when buying blind. One thing I haven't actually discussed on the channel though, and I don't really want to because I'm not someone that likes to cause any drama, but I did actually buy this car from a dealer. This dealer did assure me that the car was running well and never mentioned any issues about rattling engine on startup, even though he said in writing that he had noticed it. But I think the thing that's most shocking of all is that this car was sold to me with a one year advisory free MOT. And that actually makes me a little bit cross because the tire on the front left is actually dangerous. I mean, that could well cause me some issues on my drive home now. And not only that, the exhaust clamps at the back have completely corroded away and that would be an MOT failure as well. So the fact that this thing did pass its MOT on the morning that it was delivered to me with no advisories doesn't really sit too well. So I think I do need to have a chat with the dealer that I bought this car from because I'm not best pleased with how it was described. Of course, I don't expect perfection from a 6,000 pound 
Maserati. I was aware that it was a category S car, but I didn't expect a dangerous car to arrive on my driveway, sold on the pretense of running well and being safe. So whilst this is not the fairy tale ending to part two of the Maserati saga that I had hoped for, it's not over yet. I will keep you updated, of course, in what goes on with my ownership with this Maserati. Do I just keep it and run it and leave the cam variator issue? Because it's not really worth spending four or five thousand pounds on this car because I'd be so much money into it then that I could just buy a nicer one anyway. Do I try and get my money back from the dealer? Or shall I just do all the things that I want to do in this thing, get some tires on it, get the suspension looked at, make sure the brakes are okay, and go on a big adventure into Europe? I don't know, but make sure if you're not already to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any future uploads. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one very, very soon. Thank you so much if you've recently joined me over on Patreon. I really appreciate the support. This is going to help me make more videos like this. And in return, you can get yourself access to my videos 24 hours before everybody else and have your name mentioned at the end of the video, just like this.